I'd never talked to Jerry Conway before. Surprised. He said, do you know what makes you different from any other writer in all of Spider-Man? And I'm like, no, Jerry Conway. <laughs> what does? Because he was, he was writing Spider-Man when I was- He was your Spider-Man writer, was, right? Yeah, buying him off the rack. And I was just like, this is so cool. And he goes, you're the Spider-Man writer during the age of social media. For the first time ever, we're not talking about you as current writer on a Spider-Man book. It's still uh, hard to get used to. Uh, yeah, no, it's still, great. It, that, that's I've Nick's, already asked, what's happening no, to Amazing that, Spider-Man? That's Nick Spencer's problem. <laughs> Do you even know what's going on in that book anymore? I, yes. <laughs> no, because we have these big meetings where we're in a room for like three times a year. And Nick will say something like, oh, oh, that's going to happen to that character that I created. Okay, sure. Sure. Ooh. No, <laughs> so it's like, there is a time when like, I was walking people through a story and it was a story where uh, J, J. Jonah Jameson's father, J. Jameson Sr. died, um, was a big part of the story. And he'd been alive for, you know, almost the start of Brand New Day. He went all the way through Spider-Man 600. He got married Aunt May, made it past 700, made it past the return of Peter. And then like in the clone conspiracy story right beforehand, he died. And I walked everyone through that story. And while I, when I hit that beat in the room, you hear this, no! And I look over and it's Mark Wade <laughs> who created Jay Jameson. And he's, why? <laughs> it's like, okay, okay. You feel so, an attachment to somebody yeah, that you, you, that you, you personally you created you made that and brought thing. into the universe. And, and Mark was like, I thought I created something that was going to like last and live into the next. It's got to feel... Yeah. Doubly special when you create a character that becomes part of Spider-Man canon, which is, you know, we were talking off camera, but the, the great, rich history of all the characters around Spidey. It, it's, he has the best supporting casting character uh, in all of comics, Marvel or DC or any, any continuity. He, you know, you're Jonah, you're Flash, sorry, very sorry, Betty, every, you know, all the different characters. And every writer comes in and brings in new cast members. And the, the cast grows and grows, and they're also rich. Uh, Peter Parker's life is so rich with, with such a wonderful array of characters. Uh, so, yeah, I, I killed Marks. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I, yeah, and now whenever I hear something like something that's going to weird happen to one of my characters, not necessarily death, but like something weird that'll happen, I'll be like, okay, that's cool. Mm. All right. No, because I've, I've seen the worst of it. I've been inoculated. I've watched other people's reactions. But it, you, you have that little bit of like, oh, oh, you're doing that with my character. Like when I was doing She-Hulk, I built up her law firm and like all her legal stuff. And then I did A lot did of it, legalese in that series. Which is completely made up. I don't understand the law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, all, of, all of Charles Soule's stuff was accurate because Charles Soule is a lawyer. So he, he knew. You just it. lied. I just, no, I treated it like with the same way I treat science. It, pim particles and, you know, adamantium. I, if I know that, I don't have to deal with like real world physics or real, no, just it's whatever makes the story more interesting. So my take was, oh, what I'm dealing with in She-Hulk is superhero law. It's law that we don't have on our earth, but they have on theirs. So I know how it works. So shut up. <laughs> that's how that's how it works. I did this whole storyline, which took her out of the law law firm, and then I I worked really carefully to put her back in before I left. So I, when I passed the book on to Peter David, I can go, I returned the status quo. And he went, Oh, I'm getting her disbarred immediately. I don't want to write her as a lawyer. You just did a whole couple of years of that. I don't want to be the guy who does the next run of her as a lawyer. I want to have my own stamp. And I go, You know, that makes sense. You know, that totally makes sense. Um, so it's kind of, you know, you try to put the toys back in the box. Like with Spidey, we always knew when we made him a CEO of his own company, when we made him a, purposely a poor man's Tony Stark, that I always knew his company was going to lie in ruins by the end of the story, that it would because be... Because of the Parker luck. Or Parker's heroism, that it would be the sacrifice he makes for the benefit of, of the world. Like, that it was his, him having all this power as a CEO was something he had to use responsibly. Um, that uh, I always knew I was going to return it to factory setting before I passed it off to the next guy, um, even before I knew it was Nick Spencer. And Spidey works better, too. 
struggling with the day to day. That's oh. one of the, the great hallmarks of the character too. A absolutely. Nothing against your own because I oh, enjoyed no, it. No, and no. I thought you did a great job with it. But there's something about Spider-Man having money. I, under <laughs> that the, that's weird. wrong. No, that's weird. And that's why I did it because you know you you've had the character for over 50 years and you keep like what's the new thing what's the new angle what's the thing that i've never seen that before in a spider-man comic and since i knew i was going to return him back to factory setting before i pass him off i'm like the weirdest thing i'm going to do is i'm going to okay here's peter with all this tons of money if if i did it my big regret of that whole era is i didn't go far enough i should have gone even more ludicrous and insane you know, Peter with a flying shield car everywhere. You know, I should have like Peter with a, you know, like living in the Monte Carlo casino or something. I should have done, you know, giant, you know, I, I, I'm, pic I'm picturing if you would have done the, the outrage on Twitter. Who, nobody's. Every, <laughs> every week because you engender more <laughs> boisterous, Anim I was, not animosity because not everybody that goes after no. you. Some, some people, I, I read your Twitter feed when, when you were on it regularly. Yeah. And boy, you really sparked some debates and arguments on your Twitter feed. I'd rather have you be like really into it and like caring, like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? Or what have they done to Spider-Man? As long as when you put Peter in that situation, he's Peter in that situation. I don't mind taking the fish and putting him completely out of water because it'll give us something we haven't seen before. Like so many people um, at the beginning of Superior you'd get all these diehard fans going, what are you doing? And a lot of that is, you know, it, it's comfort food. Spider-Man is comfort food. They've had a hard day at work and they followed Spider-Man their whole life and Wednesday comes and they want to sit down and read their Spider-Man comic. They, they've ordered their Big Mac and they want to eat their Big Mac. And suddenly you've gone, we're not serving Big Mac, we're only doing McRib. And they're like, what? No! No! Where's my Big Mac? I always ordered the Big Mac. Why did you do Changes this to are. me? Yeah, and then when you get to the end of the run and you, you bring back the Big Mac and you take away the McRib, people go, you remember when they served McRib? I love the McRib. When are they going to do that again? You know, that's, that's when we knew, you know, Tom Brevoort said to me, you're going to know Superior worked. If the moment people see you're going to pull it away, they get upset. And they go, well, well, I like Doc Ock now. I, I want to see what's going to happen. Good. Were you surprised at, at how the reaction changed? Because I remember I talked with you when, when that was happening, and you had just had some death threats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unlike Tom King, you did not have a bodyguard. <laughs> I did. Unless you did. I did. We didn't talk about it. Yeah. Oh, unlike Tom. No, 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 no. I mean, there were pals at the convention. No, there was, there was. Um, but I, no, but yeah. in all seriousness, you did have death threats. People were really upset about it. And, it, was, it was on CNN. And you did several <laughs> interviews yeah. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the wake of that, and you said, let's wait a little bit, let's see how the story unfolds, and let's see if I can turn, change people's minds. And I think a lot of people look back on that run, mm -hmm. and they say it worked oh, because we, you pulled it off. Once people saw that at the end of the Venom run that Ghost Pete was back, they could see the ticking clock, they knew Peter was going to come back, but how were we going to do it? Then everyone was in because everyone knew that there was like a pot of gold at the end. Everyone knew that, ah, something's gonna happen. And when he put on that suit again, and when he confronted Green Goblin, everyone was just like, yeah! So it, yeah, we, we played everybody. But that, that's the fun of it. You know, do you wanna get the same Mad Lib story every, every month? No. Um, that said, Fantastic Four is all comfort food. <laughs> no, I, I wanna follow up on something. I wonder, is it worth it for a comic creator in this day and age no. to be invested <laughs> in, in, in social media? Yes and no. You have to know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. Um, I didn't know how to do it well in that um, I look at, there's certain people I look at on social media and they're great at it. You know, I, I look every now and then at like Gail Simone or, or Scott Snyder. I look, there's certain people that really have it down. Um, I, I, I think, you know, 2.0 version, I get it. Um, when the death threats were happening, uh, it was the first time Jerry Conway ever reached out to me. I'd never talked to Jerry Conway before. I'm surprised. Yeah, he reached out and went, I want, I want you, you, you're doing great. Don't worry about this. He said, um, do you know what makes you different from any other writer in all of Spider-Man? And I'm like, no, Jerry Conway. <laughs> what does? Because he was, he was writing Spider-Man when I was... He was your Spider-Man writer, was, right? Yeah, buying him off the rack. And I was just like, 
this is so cool. And he goes, you're the Spider-Man writer during the age of social media. Yeah, and he said, if I had been writing um, Death of Gwen Stacy and Twitter and Facebook existed. Oh, Lord. Yeah. So, and that put it all in perspective. Where you just, yeah. Can and, you imagine if Twitter was around in 73? Well, I, I look at my entire run of Spidey and, and there's like, there's like one or two clunkers where I'm like, oh, they're kind of like regrets. Like, I wish I could do it again. Which one? Name them. Uh, the, the biggest one was Alpha. Alpha, Alpha just did not work. Um, the, the different thing is I notice if I meet someone who read Alpha in the trade, they don't see what all the problem is. If I met someone who read Alpha as it came out month to month, and they have all that time on social media to talk and all that time to fume and fuss over it, those people hate Alpha. The people who read it in the trade for the first time and read it all in one lump and didn't have to wait a month in between each chapter, they're perfectly cool with it. And because it was, it was never built to be a three-part story, it was built to be the 50th anniversary, a very large story, and then our budget changed. And they went, ooh, Dan, you don't get the whole thing. We're gonna run stories that we already have in the drawer that we paid for that are gonna be stories two and three, and you'll do a third of Alpha. Just do it like a normal size comic. And the story is very simple. The story is Pete's a scientist now. Pete has a science experiment. He has a high school group come in to show them from Midtown High, like, look, I'm gonna show you my science experiment. His experiment goes kablooey and a kid gets powers. And so now it's Pete's responsibility. It's the origin again with a new twist. And the, the bit was gonna be the kid's an asshole. Can we say that? Sure, we'll say, bleep it out. The kid's a, a you know, he's an a-hole. He's, and what happens with this kid who has all this power and Spidey's trying to train him and, and use the power responsibly. And by the end of the story, Spidey fights the kid and takes the powers away. Because if you're not gonna be you know, responsible, with it, you don't get it. And that's, that's the very simple version of the Alpha story. But the way we teased it was Spidey gets a sidekick. So everyone thought Alpha was gonna be like the new Robin. And everyone wants to see, oh, who, who's the sidekick going to be? Oh, he's an a-hole. I don't like him. You're not supposed to like him. He's going to lose his powers by the end of the story because he's an a-hole. But it, everyone just got into that rhythm of, oh, this kid is not going to be the new sidekick. Why would they introduce this kid on the 50th anniversary? And, uh, and then by the end of it, good, I'm glad he lost his powers. That story sucked. And I'm like, ugh. It, it sucked in that how it was told. It sucked because it was a comic that came out in three months. And that's not the way the story was built. Mm -hmm. um, so that was frustrating. Like, if I could do it again, and the second my editor goes, we're cutting it to third, and I'll go, I, part of me wants to go, because I've seen other writers with other stories, I'm not gonna say what they are, be given the option, do you wanna kill this and just do a new story? And I should have done that, because it wasn't built to be that thing. Um, but part of me was like, no, I think we can, I think we can swing this. I'm like, Arr. so yeah. I appreciate the honesty in, in, in laying bare the, the, the story regret you have yeah. from your time on Spidey. Give me your proudest moment. Oh God, on there, that run. there's too many because I worked with like I was on the book for ten years, ten and a half years. I'm like, it was like this is like a fifth of my life. You know, is is and he's my favorite character of all time. So for heroes, my favorite villain of all time is Doctor Doom. So I'm in heaven right You're now. You're in heaven right now. I'm in heaven right now. So, but the, uh, my favorite hero of all time, my character of all of fiction, like screw Hamlet, Spider-Man. <laughs> it's Spider-Man. He's like the best. Um, uh, but 10 years was enough. Like part of me sure. went when like, I did 600, 700, I knew, okay, 800, it's time to go. <laughs> like, well, because Ben just shafted you. He didn't tell you he was leaving. If, if, <laughs> <laughs> that the, someday I'd like to come back and do a couple issues and do some more. And it's not to knock Bendis off the mountain. It's because it's like climbing all the way up to K-12 and stopping 12 feet from the top and going, well, I'll turn around. It has nothing to do with Brian. It has everything to do well, with... you'll send him an email. No, you'll no, no. You'll send him an email. No, <laughs> no. Guess no, what I just turned in. No, 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 no. Brian, Brian now is the king of cinema, too, man. <laughs> Brian, Brian is, has brought Miles Morales, a new Spider-Man, for a whole new generation that will be forever in people's imagination, will be forever for generations to come. Miles is now 
officially, more than ever in the comics or being in a cartoon, he is now, generations who've never seen anything like this are gonna have Miles, and that's one of the greatest achievements. That How many new characters can you say that about, you know, with, with every, every decade of comics? You know, it's it's rare to get a Wolverine, to get a Venom, to get like sure. a, pun, a Punisher. You know, anything after the age of Stan and Steve and Stan and Jack. You could count them on, on like one hand, the, the, the characters that stuck. That stick. And you just named them, I think. Yeah, and, and Brian gave us all one of those. And it's a Spider-Man. It's amazing. Well, it's not amazing. It's Miles, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> but that's that's an achievement. No, so no, so it's not about, the, it, it's, I came so close. And, and part of me just thought, uh, Brian is forever going to be this far ahead and out of reach. I've done over 180 issues, 600, 700, 800. And the thing that confused everyone was I said, um, I want to do 801. And they're like, what? That's weird, because we want to relaunch with a new number one. And I'm like, why 801? I was like, because I know what my last big arc is, and it's all fireworks. It's, it's Norman Osborn gets the Carnage symbiote the biggest thing, his two greatest villains smushed together as one composite being, you're, you're screwed, Spider-Man. You're, you're like, oh my God. How's it's, he gonna get out of How's he gonna get, someone who's, you look at like all, all of Spidey's villains, there's, there's, there's really two that have landed the biggest blows, even though Doc Ock swapped his brain for two years. No, Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy, killed the, the, the first woman you ever loved. And the other is Carnage kills the most people and you're Spider-Man and you want to save everyone you can. He has the most blood on his hands. So it's you have the, you have the chainsaw and you have the scalpel. You know, you have these two and you put them together and you're like, what's going to happen? And I always knew that was my big finale and it was going to be called Go Down Swinging. I saved that one. <laughs> yeah. You wrote it down, you put it aside? Yeah. Put it aside. This is my final big arc. Do you arc. do that a lot with stories? Yes. And uh, so that was like, that was always saved. But I always knew I didn't want to go out on the fireworks. I wanted to go out on my version of Kid Who Collects Spider-Man. I wanted to go out on my curtain call, on my just a nice down-to-earth Peter Par what Peter Parker, what Spider-Man means to a New Yorker. I always knew I wanted to go out with that. What you're working on now is the return of the first family of Marvel. You brought back the Fantastic Four. Yes. As you referred to it, it's comic book comfort food. It's bringing back these, the the, thing you this want. family. You, you, you want them so bad. They're, 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 they're the first family of, of comics, but they're also the explorers. They're the ones who, who, who go and venture into the unknown, right? Uh, what do you know now about the Fantastic Four that you didn't know when you started? Absolutely nothing, Mike, because FF is in my veins. I've wanted to do this book for so long. I, you know, this was like on my wish list. When I, when I told everyone I'm leaving Spidey after 800, I didn't have a book to jump onto. I did not have a parachute. I, I was leaving the plane. And I, back then it was Axel Alonso, our editor in chief. And I would have a meeting with him and he'd go, okay, what would you like to do? And I, I had like this one cardinal rule, which I, I knew behind the scenes, a lot of guys tried to push me off the, the Spider-Man stoop to get it. And I knew how bad. Yeah, everyone wants to write Spider-Man. Everyone Spider wants to write Spider-Man. But yeah, so I found out like, uh, you know, I'd hear stories like, oh yeah, that guy had a meeting to uh, try to get your book. I'm like, Jesus. So, but then again, I did stay on the book for 10 and a half years. So I knew how that felt. So my one rule was, I don't want to push anyone off a book. You know, if a book opens, let's talk about it. And they kept coming to me going, okay, hey, this book's opening. Would you like to write this? I'm like, nah. <laughs> They'd be like, what do you want to write? And I'm like, oh, I know what I want to write. And they're like, what do you want to write? And I'm like, I'd like to do Fantastic Four or Indiana Jones. And then Axel would go, we're not doing Fantastic Four or Indiana Jones. <laughs> I'd be like, okay. And then we'd meet again a couple months later. And he's like, okay, this big book is going to open up. Huge Marvel character. Would you like to do that? And I'm like, no. Nah. No, not that one, no. And he's like, what do you want to do? He's like, I'd like to do Fantastic Four or Indiana Jones. He's like, we're not doing. And it became this running thing. And he thought I was doing a joke. I'm like, no, but you know, the Fox thing could happen. And then when we got Lucas, and he could have. And like, he's under the Marvel umbrella, and we're, like, we're not doing this work. And it just became this running thing. And then the time started running out. Like, 
800 was coming and there was nothing to jump onto. And I was like, oh my God. And they called me on the phone one day um, before the news broke about Brian. Um, well, we'd, we'd, been at a, we'd been at a Marvel summit back when Brian was still there. And um, Ta-Nehisi Coates was in the room. And he, he'd been to some of the summits, but he's a very busy man. Um, and we kind of have a way of doing things um, that he wasn't aware of. He wasn't aware of certain like kind of protocols. So we're in the room and uh, Mark Wade mentions, oh yeah, I'm wrapping up my run on Captain America. And I'm going, oh, Captain America. Yeah, I, I would write Captain America. Okay, okay, first break, I'll go to the Captain America office and express my desire to write Captain America. And then if they're cool with that, we'll go to the editor-in-chief and we'll say, you know, Dan has some ideas he'd like to pitch. and Following see, all the proper channels? Yeah, going through the, you know, chain of command. And while I'm calculating all of this, Ta-Nehisi Coates goes, wait, Captain America's free? I do cap. <laughs> just in the room. He just says it in the room. <laughs> uh, the, 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 huh? And then and Axel Alonso just want to go, Done! Ta-Nehisi Coates and Captain America, that's, that's a no-brainer, that's great! Done! We got a Captain America guy! you just sat in your chair and stayed quiet. I just went, what, 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 damn it! <laughs> so, I, I was in that mindset of like, you know, the clock is ticking, and there are all these characters I love in the Marvel Universe that I haven't been offered yet, and I, which I would dearly love to do. Um, I'm not saying what I turned down, because I don't want you to go, oh, that guy's doing the leftover, that guy picked up the scraps, Dan didn't want. No, but there were great characters I said no to because they just weren't my thing. Like I kind of, I can say, okay, I can say it with DC. I won't mention it with Marvel. Like I would never want to write The Atom. Not a fan? No, no, I love The Atom. I love reading about The Atom. But the appeal of The Atom is he uses real world science. I'm, I'm fine. You're Marvel science I'm guy. I'm fine with, yeah. I'm fine with, you know, if you put me in the DC universe, nth metal, I'm there. But you, <laughs> but I, you have to write a good Atom story where he uses like, you know, some kind of quantum theory thing that's real, I'm screwed, I can't write that. So like, I love reading it, don't wanna write it. So there are a lot of characters like that in the Marvel Universe where whatever their thing is, I go, I'm not a good fit for that guy, um, even though I love reading it. Um, and uh, one of the characters on my wish list, they, they call me up and they go, we want you to find out before the news breaks, Brian is leaving you know, he's going to go over to DC. And I'm like, well, that, that's, that's a shame. You know, he's one of the, our heaviest hitters. He's great in the room, he, he's, he's a legend. Um, I wish him well. And we're like, uh, and there's like silence on the phone. I want, I want Iron Man! <laughs> <laughs> like, the body's not even cold. <laughs> yes, and I'm like, give me Iron Man. I'm like, what, what would you do you with You learned that? your lesson about, from Cap. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, they're like, what would you do with, with Tony Stark? I'm like, he's, he's Robert Downey Jr., he's Tony Stark. He's the, the, the cornerstone of the, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everyone in the world, I was saying, we live in a world where ever, when I was growing up, we knew. We knew who Iron Man was, uh, that was it. No one else, but we knew like, Bruce Wayne is Batman, Peter Parker is Spider-Man, the world knows this. But now we live in a world Everybody knows yeah. Tony Stark is Iron Man. I'm like, this is like one of the richest characters. He's, he's there at all the best Marvel stuff, Kree Skrull War, fighting, you know, fighting Modoc, fighting everybody. He had Tony so Stark. Oh my God. It, it's Iron Man. Um, and I'm like, well, what would you do with it? And I'm like, we live in a world where Black Mirror is like the coolest thing, where technology is always moving ahead. No one should be a better technological marvel. No one should be more of like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. That's Tony Stark. And there's all these cool things you can do with what are the boundaries of technology that Tony Stark can push forward and you can do the weirdest stories with that. And they're like, okay, you know what you're doing. Do, do Iron Man. I'm like, yay. And then with Iron Man under my belt, I can do two books a month when they're not oversized, crazy books. And then suddenly the, the Fox deal happened and they went, FF? I'm like, holy, yes. So now I am the guy writing the Marvel action 90s adventure hour. <laughs> 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 writing, you know what I'm talking about. I'm totally, yeah. you just need to pick up the Hulk now and you've got and it you all that, covered. Yeah, do Silver Surfer again, you have that whole Underrated Fox. cartoons, yeah. underrated cartoons. Iron Man with the mullet. 
with the, with the big with I the big hammer. Wonder Man showed up with his West Coast Avengers mu- oh. mullet. It was glorious. Do you, do you, do you remember the uh, on an outer space adventure? <laughs> You're the worst theme song. But but you watch the second season. They got so much. But when they ditched the yeah, theme song. Yeah. And now more Marvel action on the Marvel Action Hour. They did a very faithful adaptation of A Blind Man Shall Lead Them. When Daredevil and versus Doctor Doom in the Baxter those, Building. Those '90s Marvel tunes, X Men gets all the pub, but those were underrated compared to what had come before. Oh, but the, the beauty of the X Men, and and you meet so many fans now where that was their gateway drug, that got oh, them yeah? into Marvel Comics was those X Men cartoons, uh, especially uh, a lot of our our uh, female readership, you know, because there were so many powerful female characters yeah. in there that that was a gateway drug for a lot of female comic fans. Between Rogue and Jean Grey and uh, Storm, there's so many, like, that got people into the thing. And you just have to play the first few beats of that song, and people get excited. I got a question for you. Hit me. John Byrne once told me that the mistake that a lot of people make when doing Fantastic Four comics is they put them as a dysfunctional family, as opposed to just a family. Every family is dysfunctional. (laughs) <laughs> and it's not, it's not that they're the, some super dysfunctional family. They have all the problems your family has. You should be able to look at them and relate to them. I love them because they're family. I think people within the first four issues when we did the whole storyline that brought them all back probably got sick of me saying the word family. It's every other word in that story. So it's, it's not just the family. It's the family that explores and goes on all these incredible adventures together. Who are we going to see? You're up to, to a big issue. The wedding issues happened. My my dream issue. I get Ben to, and Alicia. I get to marry Ben and Alicia. In in, in the canon of FF, weddings uh, are very special. Big the, things happen. Big things happen when they're not a scroll. So <laughs> that is the rule. If it's not a scroll and this isn't a scroll, you're safe. So I when I was writing the thing. Um, it was the fifth Fantastic Four book that was coming out at the time. So when one was getting cut, that was the first one to get cut. Um, I had all these grand long-term plans uh, where issue 25 was going to be the proposal. And Tom back then said, you are allowed to propose to Alicia in the thing, but if Alicia and Ben get married, you have to give that up to Straczynski. He gets to write it because that's a Fantastic Four story. You do not marry Ben and Alicia over in the Thing book or Marvel 2-in-1. That's Fantastic Four. So uh, that was one of my big regrets. We never built up to just the engagement. And when I got the FF, one of the first things I said to Tom was, so that can be a Fantastic Four story. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, we are marrying them immediately. (laughs) I am just like, I want to do the wedding. I want to have the big, giant-sized issue. Ben and Alicia are married. That, and at the time I was pitching that, I didn't know about Batman. Um, and I knew from being in all the meetings that I knew that Peter and Kitty over in X-Men, that they were going to walk away from the altar. Marvel hadn't come up with the Gambit and Rogue get married right. instead. So I was pretty sure I was going to be the only marriage. <laughs> Cut to now, and <laughs> it's marriage everywhere. But the, the thing we have... Going- Yours happened. Our wedding will happen. No one is walking away from the altar. There will be a wedding. Rings will be exchanged. This is Mr. and Mrs. Grimm, or Mrs. Masters hyphen (laughs) Grimm. They will be a couple, and they will be married, and the dynamic in the book will change. It's still about family, but now you're going to have the couple that's been married forever and the newlyweds. Now you're going to have the couple just starting out. And it really is Uncle Ben and Aunt Alicia. It really is. It's one big group. And the kids are now teenagers. And oh my God, it's a whole, it's a whole new ball of family, uh, I'm not going to say problems, family relationships um, that we're going to see. And it's, it's going to be FF to the core. Set the table for us uh, for the next uh, year of books. Who are we going to see pop up in your comic? Okay, now by the time you're watching this, you've already seen the wedding, and you know I wasn't lying. They got married. <laughs> that, that's all print. And uh, you've already seen the first major complication, which is Galactus has returned to devour the Earth again. Again? Galactus! But this time there's a twist. 
He always lands in New York. He always lands right in the where middle of the New York, where all the heroes are, and he's going to eat the earth from Manhattan. Every freaking time, Galactus, Manhattan. This time, he has landed square in the center of Doomstadt in Latveria. Ooh. Ooh. And Dr. Doom, who's gone on this hero's journey from the infamous Iron Man, and the terrible things that brined into him right at the end. We're left like, will he be a villain again? Will he be a hero? What we've seen in FF, in FF1, is he's definitely going to be a hero for Latveria, the proud you know, ruler of their country that everyone looks up to. Well, here's his first big test. You have to save Latveria. You have to save the Earth from Galactus. You know, Doom versus Galactus. Oh, we got this Galactus. Oh story God, this is. I have as an FFN. He, those are the stories that that resonate more than any other. I I have like the files, the magic files that like when you're a kid and and all the way through your life, when you get a story idea, you put it in the file. You go like, oh, I got this great Spider-Man idea. I'm gonna put it in the file. And sometimes someone eventually does one, and you have to tear it up. But you start building up these big files for you know, these Marvel characters and these DC characters, and they're always the legends. You know, you don't, you don't wake up in the morning and go, I've got a great idea for the Golden Age, Adam. No, you don't do that. You go, I, oh, this is like my this character, this is that character. So uh, one of the, the, the two biggest files I got, like, as a kid, like my notebook, my scrapbook, it's Spider-Man and Fantastic Four. Yeah, I, there's so much Fantastic Four stuff I've always wanted to do. And... There you go. Galactus lands in Latveria. I have wanted to see that forever. And now we get to, I get to do it. So there, there's a lot of my first year of uh, FF, which is all wish list. Like if you ever got a chance to write the Fantastic Four, what would you do? Does that include Thundra? You will see Thundra of all places. Well, you've already seen her if you've, if you've read the, uh, the wedding issue. Uh, she is the one girl who crashes Johnny's... Uh, Bachelor party. She doesn't want to do what the girls are doing on the bachelorette party. That's boring. What they're doing sounds like arts and crafts. <laughs> Let's go to the boxing match. Let's do this. Let's do that. I'm with you, with the men, you know. I, let's see if they can keep up with the Femazon. <laughs> That's, so Thunder is hanging out with the guys. She's crashed the, the guys' bachelor party. Um, and that was fun. And Adam used drew it. And it, yeah, 18 pages of Adam Hughes interiors. Um, that was, you know, now we can talk about the wedding post. You, you know, yeah. I can spoil it for you. Sure, spoil I, it for me. I'm not spoiling it for them. But the, the, the format is it's three stories, each comic book length, with a bridging sequence by one of our FF artists, uh, Aaron Cooter, where he tells the bridging sequence and the final story, which is the wedding itself. But the lead story, it's um, Mike Allred, the first story up, where it's Mike and I telling the story of Ben and Alicia's first meeting, Ben and Alicia's early romance, the first kiss, how it all came about, and how integral Sue was in that, how Sue is the invisible hand that was making everything work. That was a joy to tell, and I've had that story in my pocket forever. I got to write Ben and Alicia's first kiss, and I was really happy with that. Uh, it's, I love that scene, and, and why Sue is doing what she's doing. Um, I've wanted to tell that story forever. And then the second story is just the shenanigans story. It's, it's, Reed is doing a terrible job as best man, and he's doing all this other stuff instead of his best man duties. Are we really surprised by that? No. I can't picture Reed as being a great bachelor party no. planner. No, he is not. So Johnny's like, I'll do it. You know, so Johnny's like, get Reed out of here. So Johnny, even though he's not the best man, he throws the bachelor party, and it's a Johnny Storm bachelor party. <laughs> and that's just shenanigans, and that's all, uh, that's all Adam Usart. Question, because you're writing the FF with the smartest guy in the universe, Reed Richards. Yep. Dr. Doom was probably the second smartest guy in the universe in there, or third. He's top three, probably. And you're also writing Iron Man with Tony Stark, you know, billionaire genius, philanthropist, playboy. So you're saying Reed, smart guy. Doom, smart guy. Tony, smart guy. 
But they're not the smartest person in the universe. No, no, no. That's Valeria Richards. <laughs> what is the attraction as a writer? And, but you also spent 10 years you know, writing Peter Parker. Who's a smart guy? A, a very smart guy. It's way what smarter is the attraction to, to writing such intelligent characters? And it, it, does it make your, your job really, really hard? No, it does not because the difference is they can have a thought in a, a minute that it took me two weeks to have and you don't get to see the long math. I don't have to show you the math. They can have the cleverest idea in the world because it's the idea I had you know, when inspiration struck me. It wasn't the idea I had to have in the heat of the moment. They get to, you know, it's always more fun to write a clever character um, than it is to write like a dumb character. Yeah, you want, it's more fun. The story can take an interesting twist. And uh, in the case of Peter Parker, he's a very self-destructive smart character. Uh, not, not quite self-destructive in that he'll always do the right thing even if it hurts him. So a lot of times we get the, it provides good soap opera. Uh, Reed, it, it's different when he's a smart guy, but where that smart's going to take us, mm -hmm. it's going to take us to new dimensions and new planets and new worlds and new concepts. That's different. Um, it, it's as different a flavor as Ditko is to Kirby. Uh, this is fun. I get to use my Kirby brain, my, my Lee Kirby brain. You know, before I was using my Lee Ditko brain, now I get to Lee Kirby it. You bring up Lee and, Lee and Ditko, obviously, 2018 saw both of these legends yeah. uh, sadly leave us. You cross paths with both of them, which is rare because, well, it seems like the entire planet had a Stan Lee moment at some point. <laughs> Stan, Stan, Stan was everywhere. Stan cameoed in all of our lives. <laughs> he he re really did. But you also had a conversation with Ditko when you were working in the Marvel offices, and he came by. Yeah. Drop off art. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am got to meet Steve Ditko. Um, that was a thing. <laughs> so, you know, it was very much, you know, he's the, he was the J.D. Salinger of comics. You know, this kind of like elusive, almost urban myth. You know, um, I was the art returnist at Marvel and I had the original art for the Squirrel Girl story, the last thing he did. Um, probably one of the reasons I was so like enamored with Squirrel Girl. Um, and I had to return the art to him. And normally what that meant was you, you sent out an art release form in the mail, you got it back, and then you packaged it and sent it back. Um, I, this, this is going to date it, because in the 90s, I had a giant Rolodex that had the... <laughs> <laughs> kids won't know what this is, all the millennials. Look it up, kids. And, I had a giant Rolodex that had everyone's number and address. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm doing it. I'm flipping to Steve Ditko. Oh my God, oh my God. And I get to his card, and it was the one card in the entire Rolodex. It just had a number. There was no address. I had nowhere to send this form. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm doing Oh my God, I am calling Steve Ditko. Okay, okay, okay. Hi, Mr. Ditko, hi. Uh, this is Dan from the Marvel offices. I'm the art return department. I have the Squirrel Girl. Uh, story, and I would like to send you the art release form, but I don't have an address. He goes, I live in the city. I'll drop by. Uh, are you there now? I'm like, yes. He's like, okay, I'll be right over. I'm like, oh my God, Stephen <laughs> Joe is coming to my office. Oh my God, ah, ah. You know, I'm like, right here. I'm like preparing. By the time he got there, I had like the art, the package, the form, a pen, <laughs> you know, just like everything clear of the desk besides that, and all I'm thinking in my head, just running on a loop, do not talk about Spider-Man, do not talk about Doctor Strange, do not talk about Spider-Man, do not talk about Doctor Strange. Just let the man pick up his art. Because the, he had a thing in the 90s for a while where he would draw Marvel comics. Sure, he did Speedball. Speedball, Squirrel Girl, he did like an Avengers annual. Sure. Late he, 80s, he did like some, uh, some ROM issues, I remember. Yeah. Some great ROM issues. His one rule was, I won't draw Spider-Man or Doctor Strange. I won't draw any character I created. You know, th that was his ethical, that was his Mr. A, you know, line in the sand. You know, I will not, that was the rule. So I knew those were subjects you just didn't bring up. So I'm just, that's running in my head over and over and over again. And he showed up and he's got his little wind blazer and he's got his little jaunty cap and St Steve 
Ditko in front of me. And I just like, he signed the form. I gave him, I'm like, thank you, Mr. Ditko. He's like, thank you. He smiled, he walked off, and the minute the door closed, I was all like, oh my God. So yeah, it was like, he existed. Amazing. <laughs> I met him. I'm like, oh my God, Steve Ditko.